Again, my name is Robert Lamb, Director of the Program on Crisis, Conflict, and Cooperation here at CSIS. Uh, thank you all for coming so far today. Um, the, um, the morning panel is about to begin, so if you could please take your conversations out into the lobby or um, fill in the seats in the front here, that would be, uh, that would be great. Thanks very much. A lot of the work that we do in the stabilization and reconstruction field uh, involves projects and efforts that, that sometimes look uh, a lot like regular development work. And um, there seems to be a lot of confusions oftentimes between development and stabilization and reconstruction and transitions. Um, and uh, one of the purposes of this panel will be to clear up the distinction between sort of the longer term development efforts and what stabilization and reconstruction uh, efforts um, are. Um, but we're doing it through, through the lens of uh, Colombia and Liberia. And I can think of um, no better colleague of mine than uh, Joanna Mendelson Foreman to lead this panel. Joanna and I had the the pleasure of working together in Colombia in um, former FARC held zones uh, to evaluate USAID's transitions programs in Colombia. Um, and we've been working together pretty closely for the past few, few years. Um, Joanna, some years ago, uh, was one of the co directors of the program that is now the um, Crisis Conflict Cooperation back then was called the Post Conflict Reconstruction Project. Um, and um, her full bio is in your program. I encourage you to take a look at um, her very impressive impressive um, life's work. I would like to turn it over to Joanna to lead the panel. Thanks, Joanna. Uh, thank you, uh, Bob. Uh, I'm really pleased to be leading off this first discussion, first because we have a really distinguished group of participants who can speak not only as expert practitioners, but individuals who've served in the capacities as civilian leaders in this field. So thank you all for joining us today. I feel in some ways like the madrina or godmother of this field, because when this started, and I think Ambassador Ayalde can say this, we really, in the US government, were not clear where these transition offices would go. Go. Uh, in fact, my just as a little piece of history, when we were first asked to write a transition plan for Haiti, we were told, do it in six months because regular normal development will take over. Uh, little did we know what we were doing then, and we all learned by doing. I see people in this room who were there with me from the start, uh, and we learn over the period of time that this is a, not easy, that there are many lessons that we've learned, some that we haven't applied, perhaps many. And I think one of the most dramatic changes, and these two cases of Colombia and Liberia point to it, is that we have now achieved what is the nexus of security and development, something that when this field began, many in the development community had their doubts about. But if anything has happened over the course of the last 20 years, it is precisely a much more <laughs> seamless, I would say, integration of the primacy of security when things are hot and in a conflictive state, and the relevance of development not only after things have quieted down, but also sometimes when things have not. And I think the case of Colombia provides a very good example of a situation where development has been going on simultaneously with a hot war, but also at a time when a transition was also taking place. Um, I am not going to take up my panelists' time. I could say a lot of things, but let me also mention the comparison with Liberia, and we will talk a little bit more about this later. We're going to start the panel with Ambassador Liliana Ayalde and Juan Pablo Franco, both, uh, both of whom have extensive experience in Colombia, uh, and although their biographies are in the book, I must say that it is Ambassador Ayalde, when she was the mission director in Colombia, that really saw the opportunity opportunity at the time when Colombia was perhaps in one of its darkest moments of history and really on the brink of disaster in terms of state failure, that the USAID mission came up with one of the most creative plans working with the government of Colombia to begin consolidation of those zones that had been retaken by the military with uh, great support from the US in terms of Plan Colombia. And I think it's that experience specifically that provided a model 
for dealing with transitions during an actual hot war, but simultaneously creating an enabling environment for development. That to this day has become in many ways both a example of a light footprint by the US government, but also an important way in which to deal with local populations. Both our speakers, we're gonna start with Colombia, and um, I believe that both uh, Juan Pablo and uh, Ambassador Alialde have some comments to make first about how they see the US support for transition, and then I'd like to pose a few questions to you. Then we'll follow with our panelists, and I will introduce them. Uh, but of course, there's Ambassador uh, John Blaney, who was our ambassador to Liberia, uh, Sean McFate, who is a distinguished professor and an experienced person now at TD uh, International, and of course, my old friend Franklin Moore, an assistant administrator of USAID in the Africa Bureau, but has played many, many roles in my experience there. So Ambassador Alialde, if you'd like to start. Thank you, Johanna, and thank you for inviting me to share some of my perspectives um, in this very important um, forum. Um, there are many lessons learned from the experience in, in Colombia uh, and the success of its transformation, but I, what I wanted to do is focus precisely on the uh, <coughs> the model or the experience in Macarena, which is what Joanna was, was referring to, and maybe pull out of it some uh, principles that, that uh, many of us that worked there at the time, jointly with the Colombians, of course, a very talented and a very dynamic team, um, I, I, we've been able to pull out, because at the time we were ex going through this, we didn't really realize um, how uh, it was going to have an impact in, in the work in the future. So what I'd like to do is just pull out some of uh, ten, 10 basic principles that I think uh, uh, you can continue to think about and maybe uh, use in, in other similar experiences. And this is af uh, out of the Integrated Consolidation Plan for the Macarena, which is, which is also referred to as PCIM, uh, which was a small pilot in this area, which is the heart of far country, it's uh, with high production rates of up to six uh, harvests of coca a year, um, totally overtaken by the FARC and very little presence of the state. So some of the lessons that we were able to pull out is uh, that a minimal level of security over time is fundamental to consolidation, rural development, and land restitution. It sort of seems obvious, but it, you, you can't imagine how many times this was overlooked. And there was the assumption that development would bring security. And so recognizing that, this that, that there is this re basic requirement of minimal security is key in, in, for success. Uh, lesson number two, that host country ownership and political will is essential for restoring security, legitimacy, and generating developments. Um, the, in Colombia, what we found and was, what was actually very energizing and as a mission director was the ownership at all levels, at the national level, at the, um, at the government, civil society and business. People just were fed up and with what had been going on and they, were, they wanted to do something. So taking advantage of that avalanche of, of, of ownership was just very, very energizing for all of us. So, so that's very key. Lesson number three was that U.S. government assistance is a catalyst, not a replacement for the state. Sometimes there, there's assumption you go in, you, 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 you uh, implement programs, but there's nothing like um, finding those, those areas, those niches, where U.S. government assistance can actually be the turnkey, can actually uh, be a response to community needs, um, whether it's through budget or infusion of some technical support that can act as a catalyst. And, it, and we found that in some areas we were, at the beginning, 85% of the support, but as time went on, um, the government assumed more and more because we were, we were very strategic in what we did. Lesson number four, light foot, be a, a light footprint, uh, branding. That's always something that you know we do and we, we've got to get our brand out there. Well, sometimes you, we have to think twice about that. And is it strategic? Um, it's, it, what we did in Colombia was 
make sure that the, 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 uh, the branding was the government's. And so finding ways of assuring that whatever success was the government's success. And so that's the way you gain confidence. Uh, that the, the, the population gains confidence in its institutions. They see, whether it's the municipality, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Education, whatever. Those are the, the institutions that need to be up front. And, and we are in the behind supporting with the necessary uh, tools, uh, experiences, and sometimes, obviously, the funding uh, to be able to make, uh, make the population gain more confidence in its institutions. Lessons five is, Act in a short term with a vision for the long term. Although the quick, um, immediate, uh, high response projects are critical to signal a change, you have to always keep the longer term in mind. You know how are these activities actually going to be absorbed in the long time? In the long term. And um, in the case of the Macarena, we found that uh, a new economic growth program. Uh, it was essential for a long-term uh, consolidation of the region. So it's, it's essential to, to balance the two, to always keep in mind uh, that you're doing something, but in the long, uh, in very short-term vision, but you need that long-term view. The uh, lesson number six is the integration and the sequencing of all the tools. Um, we had to, the challenge of being able to coordinate of having to coordinate U.S. government uh, resources, the whole of government uh, was very much a theme. Uh, it was difficult, but it, it required that internal coordination as well as, as alongside with the uh, with the Colombians, and their leadership was critical. Uh, there was what they called a CCAI, which was a Center for Coordination, which. Um, uh, pulled together all the government resources and was able to calibrate, sequencing, prioritizing, strategically focusing, and that was critical um, at all levels, at the national level and all the way to the local level. Lesson number seven, risk taking. Um, there is a certain amount of risk, and I think I noticed that within AID, some of the officers, you had to look for those officers that were willing to take the risk. It's very easy to be comfortable. You know, we don't want to go in the conflict areas. Those are insecure. We, you know, that's, it's not going to work. But you have to take some risks in these kinds of uh, settings. Um, it's got to be uh, hands-on. You've got to be on top of the field work with the, with the partners. And it's, it's that calibration. Of, of course, not overtaking this risk, but there is a certain amount of, of risk that you have to take. Lesson number eight, evidence-based approach. Um, we dedicated a, a, a lot of resources into evaluating what we were doing. And so that we could uh, constantly uh, re re um, direct what we what we uh, had anticipated um, and the data was critical in order to uh, ensure results action research um, and, and I must say that what I'm talking about relies a lot about OT from OTI's experience uh, in in the Macarena and their operational pro approach to support action re research was uh, very much a part of, of their success. Their ability to reevaluate and retarget when necessary, have that flexibility to, uh, to move. And you know, in our bureaucracy, sometimes flexibility is not something that characterizes us. Um, critical. And lesson number ten, and I'll end with this, is the the need to identify the change agents, and at the at the community and and, and different levels, and and invest in those. Whether it's in the local area, uh, in the at the local level, uh, make sure they have the tools, maybe some leadership training, give them the mechanisms to actually be be successful. So th that in general, I'd like to sort of end here, and, and those were kind of principles and uh, that my colleagues and myself saw as, because at the time we were doing this, we were so intensely engaged in the activities, we had to take a step back and um, uh, see what contributed to the success. So I hope those are useful.
Uh, not only were they useful, but I think they set a challenge for all of us to see if other programs uh, followed a similar type of experience. But let me ask you, uh, Juan Pablo, you have some remarks, but I wanted to remind people that Thus far, we haven't talked about the humanitarian dimensions of all of these conflicts. We've been talking a lot about the socioeconomic and political components, but one of the things I know that has been a challenge in Colombia, as in Liberia, is that people are the ultimate detritus of war. They're the people who are the victims, and I know that uh, IRD has been doing a great deal with the displaced, as well as other international, as well as U.S. government agencies, and I was hoping you would uh, mention some of those things as well. Juan Pablo, because we can't forget that uh, humanitarian aid is the other side of this, and they can't be isolated. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I'll, I'll say something about the humanitarian issues at the end. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me. Thanks to IRD, ACOM, and CSIS, um, and all of you participating here. Um, my reflections are from the standpoint of being in government for almost seven years um, in what some people call a transition, but um, we don't use that word in Colombia that much. <laughs> um, and now as part of, a, of an international NGO, um, the, I want to share my reflections on three things. The idea of stabilization, the implementation of stabilization, and innovation. Um, first of all, the idea of stabilization. So I, I try to find the definition of stabilization, um, and I found the OECD definition, 2008. Actions undertaken by international actors to reach a termination of hostilities and consolidate peace understood as the absence of armed conflict. So is that in Colombia? I don't know. Um, then I saw the U.S. Army Counterinsurgency Manual. Stability operations are defined as an overarching term encompassing various military missions, tasks, and activities conducted outside the United States in coordination with other instruments of national power to maintain and reestablish a safe and secure environment, provide essential government services, emergency infrastructure reconstruction, and humanitarian relief. And probably the best one I found is USAID civilian military cooperation policy. There is no universal agreement on the definition of stabilization. Um, so what I was trying to think about is that in many cases, stabilization is a foreign idea. Um, it's, as a foreign idea, it is challenged by other ideas at the local level, level that are dominant. Um, and even in, in some cases, if these local ideas that are dominant, if they are hollow and they don't have a deep meaning, it doesn't matter. It will contest the idea of civilization. If you look at the case of Colombia, uh, we have uh, what, what we call the national development plans, four-year government plans, and it's a, it's a very successful planning tool in Colombia. It, it's been working since the 1960s. And I, I took a view of the national development plan since 1986, and no plan <laughs> made an explicit reference to stabilization, neither transitions. Um, yet we are speaking about stabilization in Colombia and, and the, the, the example of transitions in Colombia. There are similar ideas. Um, in 1986, um, what was, in a way, uh, the experience that led to the CCAI, we had the rehabilitation idea. Um, so Colombia had a national rehabilitation plan, and it, it was a plan to create development opportunities for households, communities, and economic activities in regions affected by lack of coexistence and absence of the state, which is close to what we all think is stabilization. Then in 2002, um, there was another idea, it was a good slogan, democratic security, um, which is, I would say, what Liliana is closest to. The idea of democratic security emerged as an integral policy to strengthen the dissuasive capacities of the state against terrorist activities, as well as social services in conflict zones. Um, the idea, and it was very easy to communicate, is that you need trust, investment, and growth. Um, but 
Security provides the conditions for investments and it allows to meet social goals. Um, and it was even said that democratic security was even part of eradication of poverty eradication policies. Today we speak about consolidation, what the PCIM um, started, fostered in some cases. And today we have a plan for territorial consolidation to generate the necessary institutional capacities to guarantee access and protection of people's fundamental rights in territories historically affected by armed conflict and illicit crops. So you had similar ideas, um, but these ideas were thought from the practitioner's standpoint. It, it was us in government that came up with these ideas, or in some cases, well, even the president who spoke about the democratic security a lot. Um, but you had different ideas for similar problems, which is okay. Um, but the biggest question was, what would people say to you in a town in Macarena when they are demanding goods and services? Would they ask for stability? They don't. They don't. They ask, would they ask for uh, democratic security? Would they ask for rehabilitation? Usually they, they ask for things that are more simple. So these ideas that we create at the end will have, will be challenged by the difference between what people expect and the difference be, uh, between what we define as practitioners. And if you don't realize that, the governance of your idea will not be there. Um, so the most important thing is to get to know the local ideas. Even if state capacity is low, choose the best way to adapt your ideas to the local context. At the end, ideas are important because they also define the instruments, which is the second point that I want to make. In transition and stabilization scenarios, you need to have massive, large-scale instruments. Um, transitions usually happen in large geographic areas. Um, the last panel talked about size. That's right. Geography is mostly fragmented and dispersed. Difficult climates, although not as hot as humid as DC today. But <laughs> large populations, large number of actors, uh, different interests, resources, ideas, languages. So what we needed in government and what uh, other transition scenarios need is large scale organizational capacity. Uh, if you want to deliver public goods like security, justice, health and roads, you need large scale organizational capacity. Um, scarce resources are sometimes allocated to very small projects. Um, and if they are not thought in a way that can be scaled up and can become massive, then um, it will not be such a good investment. You need to have ideas that can be ambitious to be expanded. Two examples from Colombia, the government still does uh, implement projects for the three million IDPs that we have on income generation, but it's projects that are working just for 2,000 people. So it, you're not allocating resources correctly. Or the Families Guardaosques program, which was one of the most successful ones for, poor, uh, for illicit crop eradication, but it just came up as high as 50,000 families when you needed it for 200,000 families. I want to finish with innovation. What is the role of international organizations, NGOs, uh, if you need large-scale organizational capacity, and which is mostly found in government or state structures? Well, what we can do in, in international organizations, NGOs, and donors is to spark innovation. Innovation is very hard in bureaucracies and in government. Um, you don't have any room to maneuver. You do what you are told to do by law. You don't have additional resources to invest in innovations. Um, you have rigid planning horizons. It's hard to plan for, for multiple years but mainly you have high penalties for failures. If you fail in government, you've got even personal consequences and you may go to jail. Um, so when I was in government, I always asked you, say, help me innovate. You can do it. I, you have the flexibility. Um, that's what we're doing, for example, in, in IRD. We're working, going after humanitarian assistance. We're doing a pilot on community rehabilitation. And mainly what we did was found this very good idea 
in government. They didn't have the operational capacity to test it, so we provided the operational capacity so they, so they would learn from, from us. To conclude, um, in transitions, ideas are important to define the shared goals and expectations. If there are dominant local ideas that are legitimate and shared, donors and international NGOs should adapt their own ideas of stabilization and development to them. You need ideas adapted to the local context. Ideas also define the instruments needed for implementation, but for success to be achieved, design and implementation should always consider the need for large-scale organizational capacity. You need big and ambitious ideas. Finally, donors and NGOs have a significant role to spur innovations that will lead to this large-scale implementation. You need new ideas in transitions with the potential to be big. Thank you. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to have a little more in-depth discussion now that both of you have laid out, um, Ambassador Ayalde, the 10 lessons that we've learned out of Colombia and also the points that you raised about how to bring things to scale in a way that often governments can't do. Um, would you both be able to following the conversation we had earlier this morning with Ambassador Dobbins, declare Colombia a success story? And if so, what are the elements of success? Because it's repeated time and again that this is an example of a U.S. partnership with the government of Colombia that took over a part of the country, 40% of the country at one point was completely stateless and held by a, a non-state actor, the FARC. And then, of course, it was a center for drug trafficking. Talk to us about how, both through both your lenses in the AID mission and then you in the government, would define what would make this a success and how this elements of this would be a model. And whomever wants to start. Well, I think there are many uh, perspectives uh, through which you gauge the success. Um, the freedom to travel. Uh, I, I know when I first got to Colombia, it was impossible to go from point A and by road, and, and then we did. We were able to travel without problems, um, and that's one, the freedom to be able to travel. And you look at that through the different indicators in terms of kidnappings and homicides and, and the violence, and, and those numbers, I don't have them uh, at the recent numbers, but those are significantly reduced. Um, the other is that, um, Juan Pablo, you may help me, on the number of mayors that were absent from their uh, municipalities. More than 200. Uh, and, and at one point, it was, it was such a significant out of the, of the whole that people were, were running governments from, from, uh, from, the, from the capital city. Uh, whereas now I understand that everyone's back in their in their municipalities, still with some issues. That's not perfect, but but they're in in their in their uh, communities and being able to govern. That for me is critical. If you are able to to manage uh, and 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 actually in a in a elected position and actually there, but I'm sure there are others, and maybe Juan Pablo, you can add to that. Um, well, this is a very difficult question to ask a Colombian because <laughs> um, it's hard for us to step back and analyze what we've done and to see even what some people call a success model, a successful model. Um, I would say that there is significant progress is in much of the country, but how? But there's still many issues left unsolved. Um, in an area close to to La Macarena, um, it's called San Vicente del Caguán, famous because it had it had the it was the area of the peace negotiations with the FARC in 2000. Um, I remember that we started nine years ago the CCAI program in San Vicente. Um, and now I'm working in San Vicente with IRD. And I feel sometimes that nothing changed. Mm, you still have the FARC uh, influence in the rural areas. You have 
policemen that are getting killed in in the uh, urban area. Um, you have displacement. Uh, Every week, there's 20 families that are arriving to the urban area. So what I would say is that there's some, throughout the country, things improved. They improved really fast in some parts, um, but in some areas, it has not improved, and it's starting to get worse. Um, so th I would say that we would define success when we have peace. Um, and that's, hope, that's what we're hoping for. Uh, but even if we have peace, success is hard to achieve in the sense that it could be the geography or it could be the lack of the large-scale organizational capacity that I was telling you about. Uh, the challenge will be there to implement in the field what the ideas that you're hoping for in stabilization. Even if the government has very good ideas, to implement them way outside Bogota will be a challenge, and that's where everyone can play a role. Thank you. I, I guess I should have been clear and said that there are tactical levels of success and strategic success, and it would be ridiculous for us not to acknowledge that Colombia is in a very serious peace process that is ongoing and hopefully will have a, a successful outcome. And if then if we take what Ambassador Dobbin says, there'll even be a greater chance of many of the lessons that we've described uh, being consolidated. But one of the fascinating parts that I've always thought in the Colombian experience is that now Colombia is a security exporter. That's its police yeah. are training not only uh, the police in Colombia, but they are also training people in Mexico and even in Japan. I mean, there's an international organization's section of the police when you go visit them. And I wanted perhaps both of you to think about this in terms of US assistance policy and how a light footprint in many ways helped to legitimize an institution that at one point was considered a much more negative force in the country. Yes, uh, actually I was th thinking about that, didn't say it because that's at a different level mm -hmm. and certainly the success uh, for us in the U.S. government, it's, it's been tremendous, uh, a tremendous help to have the Colombians now providing this technical assistance. Um, I work the Caribbean, I work Central America and the um, it, the Central Americans asked for the Colombians to come in. General Naranjo, who was uh, a very uh, instrumental in, in the whole process, is now an advisor, uh, officially for the Mexicans, working closely with the Centrals. Uh, there is uh, such a plus in, in having them uh, provide this technical assistance. Uh, my worry is, you know, they're going to be taking out all these officers, <laughs> mid-level officers, and um, what about back, back home? Because it is a process, as Juan Pablo uh, well said, that it continues to be challenging, and you do continue to, be, to need to have those resources, that know-how at home. But yes, we are using it um, uh, not only in the hemisphere, but also around the world. I would just add that Police is, in Colombia, is, you perceive police as a different type of police than in other countries because of the military role that they've had to play in controlling several areas of the, of the, of the, of Colombia. But um, one of the biggest challenges that we still face with police is controlling a, and policing rural areas because of the geography that it's so hard, so hard to cover. Um, but what we had to learn from the civilian side of government is that along with police and military decisions, we learned to make security decisions um, in, our, in the social investments that we had to, to make. And that was one of the things that um, made the CCAI model so interesting because we were trying to make decisions not just based on the development goals that we had or the social services goal, but we also had to know that if we, we, we couldn't be so naive to think that if we deliver those services, uh, people would be better off. Sometimes even providing those services put them at risk. Um, so maybe that, that would be uh, something that the police of Colombia can also export, how we learned that. Well. 
I, it's hard to switch over to another part of the world and another continent, but we have three speakers who've been patiently waiting to uh, provide some insights about another uh, case, uh, the interventions in Liberia, uh, the U.S. support for the transitions, and we have excellent people to comment on that. Uh, the difference, I would just point out, is that in Liberia, there was and still is a United Nations operation that was a partner with U.S. assistance in ensuring, particularly in the st uh, security sector, a transition from war to peace. And I know several of the people on the panel have had experiences with that. Um, and I would like to go and ask, uh, starting with Ambassador Blaney, who was our ambassador to Liberia, and then followed by Sean McFaid and Franklin Moore, to talk a little bit about how the case of U.S. support for the transition there, since you had two civil wars to deal with, not one, uh, worked. Thank you. Well, well, thank you, and, and, and hello, everybody. Um, in this short space of time, I thought I, the best I could do for you would be to just give you a little bit of my thinking towards Liberia on ending the war and, and, and winning the peace um, because I was an architect and implementer of U.S. strategy during that, the critical time of 2002-2005. Um, as was said earlier, it's very important for this group generally to keep in mind that there's no one recipe for every single country. I want to reiterate that. Um, because everything is different case by case. There's a million variables involved. However, <laughs> um, I think that you can take some lessons away from Liberia that are at least worthy to think about, and so I offer them to you. Um, and one of the things I also wanted to say that was said in another context and reiterate was that as, as the ambassador, as a policymaker, um, it was not a linear experience, all right? In other words, you had issues coming at you from all sides, uh, crises, armed conflicts, but you didn't do things seriatim. You didn't do things step by step. If you did, you would fail, and don't try it, is my first recommendation. Um, while we were under fire, we were worrying about how to get the humanitarian assistance in, how to revive a dead economy. You see what I'm saying? And, and, and not just about the security piece first and then we'll worry about something next. That doesn't work. You've got to think across the board, spectrum. Um, nor were the problems that we faced, um, particularly ones that, 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 that uh, stayed solved, I remember solving the same problem three or four times, <laughs> or it would morph into something else that I didn't expect at all. Now, having said all these relativistic points, I now want to offer my uh, list of, of uh, lessons learned, and, and with some similarity and some overlap. Um, I just want to offer the first one, which is, in general, and in most cases, try to make complex situations less complex. Um, in other words, uh, simplify. Now, it doesn't apply in all cases because sometimes you need complicated uh, answers to complicated situations. But you can, you, you can parse it and try to make it more simple. Let's, let's go to Liberia 2003. All right. 14-year civil war hundreds of thousands dead. It was a total train wreck, all right? And, but one thing was very clear to me and to many others is that there was not going to be peace in Liberia without the exit of Charles Taylor, who was the then warlord and president of Liberia. So once he, 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 he left, it was a little bit like the old game of pickup sticks. Does anybody remember that? I see some blank stares here. Uh, <laughs> okay, for you computer generation people, pick up sticks is you, this, this game is a pile of a mess of sticks and you pick up one at a time without move, jostling the pile and the winner simplifies, right, until you have everything removed. Now it's not the same because I said you can't do things seriatim so it's not a very good analogy. Uh, you have to do everything at once to move those sticks but we're gonna use it anyway. Um, 
And once we got the, that out of the way, then I was able to take a group on, to go make a ceasefire that stuck. We went out on the battlefield, made a ceasefire. We weren't able to do that uh, at the peace negotiations in another country. Okay, another stick comes off, right? Then that allowed us to separate the warring armies a little bit and inject a very small vanguard of West African peacekeepers, not UN peacekeepers, they came later, West African peacekeepers called Echo Mill, and permissively in between the warring sides. See the sticks coming out? See how it's getting simpler? Okay. When the UN did arrive months, months later, they did p picked up many of those sticks. Uh, perhaps most dramatically, I would say, in the disarmament of over 100,000 combatants from three different armies. Sticks come off. Well, I think you got the point. Simplify, if you can. Um, the next one I would offer to you is to internationalize the problem. I spent a lot of time on this, and what I tried to do with others, many others, was to create kind of a multi-level web of peace. Um, this web of peace provided resilience against backsliding to war and also kept, helped us keep the momentum in Liberia forward and moving. Uh, what, what am I talking about? Well, as was mentioned, we had the UN there. We had a peacekeeping, but th they, were, they were a lead element. But we also had a lot of other groups working simultaneously at, 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 on maintaining the peace and making the process move forward. The International Contact Group for Liberia, many nations. We had General Abubakar, who was the head of the peace process and chief negotiator of the, peace, of the Comprehensive Peace Accord. We had the World Bank working on economic issues of varying sor sorts. We had Western leaders. We had African leaders. We had many NGOs, some of their representatives here in this audience, working on the problem. Liberians themselves were part of this web of peace that we were creating. You can see it, right? Okay. Um, and here's the point, really. This is my opinion. I think the United States would have failed to save Liberia if we had attempted to do it unilaterally. Okay. Um, and relatedly, make sure the international mandate is the appropriate one. You know, I spent some time at the UN Security Council and the, the, the resolutions that we passed in these situations usually were either articles, what's called Article 6 agreements or Article 7 agreements. There's a huge difference between them and what you can do and what you can't do. If you get the wrong one on a situation, you've got major problems. So having the right international mandate to operate is critical. Similarly, having a decent peace agreement, if there is one in a situation that you deal with, is is also critical. Uh, I've seen peace agreements that are well written, that kind of sh have the architecture, sh have a path for countries and, and groups to move along towards stability, normalization, peace. And I've seen other peace agreements that, I don't know, maybe they got tired or something. Uh, they just, it, there's just missing pieces. It, it, it's, it really doesn't do the job, and there, it really makes it very difficult for implementers on the ground to move forward. So having a good peace agreement, that's the, that's the next one. And also worry about the threat of legitimacy. This is something I worried about a lot. Uh, when Charles Taylor stepped down, I pressed very hard against opposition to have then Vice President Moses Bloss succeed him as President of Liberia. Why? Because it was supposed to be that way under the Constitution of Liberia, even though Moses Blah was a Taylor guy. Once he stepped down, he stepped down in favor of the interim leader as specified under the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. You see it? So we had the, that leader, uh, the interim leader, he was in his post. And then as per the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, that leader then stepped aside for the election of 2005, which brought to power Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, a democratically elected president. Now, the point here 
is that nobody questions today who is the legitimate leader of the state of Liberia. Nobody. And that is very important. Next suggestion is keep tempo on your side or momentum or whatever you want to call it. Uh, it you know, this is one of the things that people almost never discuss, but it's absolutely critical in, on the ground in these operations. Um, I can think of one example uh, that comes to mind, which is that uh, I pressed the United Nations and its very able leader, Jacques Klein uh, of UNMIL, to begin disarmament negotiations in December 2003. Now, there was a riot at that time. It was a major riot. And there was criticism from the pundits in New York and Washington uh, about moving so quickly with so few people on the ground to start the disarmament process. Okay, tactically, it was very, very difficult. Strategically, it was the right thing to do. Why? Because it kept tempo on our side. It kept all these combatant groups, three different armies, focused on what our next step was on disarmament. And so we moved forward on the peace process. We didn't go back to war. There are other points in the puzzle. Uh, uh, disarmament, uh, demobilization, reintegration, security sector reform. I'm going to let Dr. McVeigh talk ably about that, as he always does. Uh, but one other point I want to mention is, is on the economic side, don't forget about it long term, short term, and don't forget about financing. I spent so much time trying to secure financing for whatever strategy I had. It is extremely difficult. My question to you is show me the money, or my remark to you is show me the money, or you don't have a strategy at all. All right? You have to have the money. On the economic side, my, my uh, emphasis was the, uh, was jobs. One thing we don't think about enough is jobs. So what we did in Liberia was to create kind of a civilian conservation corps uh, like the Roosevelt administration did in the 30s, and we hired the ex-combatants to do things, thousands of them from all different sides, to go fix the bridges they'd just blown up. <laughs> Go, go, go fix the, the clinics they just burnt down. <laughs> so, uh, so the, but it gave them a future, and it was very important toward moving forward on stability. Uh, don't forget about rule of law and corruption. Um, it's really the plague of all stabilization efforts. We can get into that uh, later on. But um, you, it's very hard to achieve a national identity or normalize in the midst of hyper-venal governments. Um, so, um, let me just conclude by making a plea for uh, having solid U.S. and other leadership on the ground and then listening to them carefully. Uh, Woody Allen once said, 90% of life is showing up. And uh, it really is. Once you get there on the ground, you're going to understand it much better than you ever can talking about it anywhere else, as many of you know. And implementation is every bit as important as the strategy you build. So my plea is to send in solid, creative, trained, interdisciplinary leaders on the ground and let them play a strong role in strategy creation and in implementation, and then listen to them carefully and don't interfere unduly. And I think I'm looking at some of those future leaders right now. Thank you very much. Thank you for those uh, really excellent words and uh, a send-off for a lot of people in this room who want to follow in your footsteps. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Sean McFate, who has a wide range of experience in many transitional societies, but has a particular expertise on the security sector reform that took place in Liberia. I know you'll address that and other issues, so go ahead, Sean. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Um, and thank you, and good morning to everybody. I worked with Ambassador Blaney during that time frame uh, in Liberia. And one of the key problems, especially in a post-conflict state, is what do you do with the military? Uh, especially if it was complicit in human rights violations and other issues, or the police force. 
Um, as many people know in this room, there's two programs that work in conjunction. One's called uh, DDR, which is Disarmament, Demobilization, and Reintegration. The second is called uh, SSR, uh, which has many names, but it's, uh, uh, what is it? No. Security sector. Security sector. Just, everybody's awake. Okay, ah, good. Thank Thanks. You. Um, um, SSR. And without going into the details as to what that looks like, I would like to say one thing about it. Um, building partnership capacity amongst our allies uh, or future allies, especially in the defense sectors, is a gateway capacity. It is a gateway capacity that, that leads from stabilization to development because security and development are linked. This is the security development nexus that Joanna started doing work on many years ago and several others. And uh, in the case of Liberia, for the military, for the, you know, the, the, the reformation, the trans, transformation of the military, that task did not fall to the US Army or to the UN. It fell to a private company called DynCorp International. I was there not as a USG official, I was there as a contractor. And this offers an interesting parallel case study or miniature case study as to stability ops and development. And I want to talk a little bit about that today briefly. And just to also note that I think it may be the first time in 150 years that one sovereign nation hired a company to raise another sovereign nation's armed forces. Which is interesting. And the, and the military today is still considered a, um, uh, a, a relative success with lots of asterisks and caveats that go along with that. Uh, but compared to what's going on in Iraq, Afghanistan, I think a case could be made. Uh, the, it's a much smaller military, but the, the, the techniques and methods of SSR and DDR are pretty much the same. They're just different in scale and scope. So when you privatize a, a function like this, there, there's, there's benefits and there's risks. Um, the benefits in this case of, of working for a company is that the company is not beholden to bureaucratic turf wars back at the headquarters. We were not DOD, we were not USAID, we were not state. We, it was a State Department contract, but we worked with all three, all three Ds. Um, and so we didn't have the institutional perspectives and perhaps uh, biases as well. Um, and that cuts both ways. The second thing is innovative approaches. We were able to do um, Interesting things that if you, if I was a DOD, I was in the army before this. I was a, I used to be a paratrooper. So there's no way as a paratrooper, I would say, I really want to have a, a good, strong human rights vetting program modeled off of NGOs. That just would not have probably gone down very well in my opinion. Um, but in, in working for a company like, well, working for a company, you can come up with innovative approaches. And we indeed created uh, a very robust human rights vetting program. We would never dream of putting a cop on the streets of DC without a thorough background check, but it happens all the time in post-conflict or conflict-affected countries because it's hard to do in countries that have no public records. But there are ways to do it, and we find out those ways and we were able to do it. We also used a human security approach in the design of the military. I won't get too much into detail on this, but it's, it's very different than a traditional national security approach. Um, we were also third, many ways more efficient. If we needed an expert, somebody who knew something very well, and we only needed them for three weeks, we could find that person and pull them out of you know, a, a think tank, an institution, for three weeks and put them on the ground, and then, and then you know, that's it. Uh, we didn't have to go through the machinations of a bureaucracy to find a GS-15 and get them moved there. And so we had a lot more flexibility, um, and that played well for efficiencies. Now, there are also some risks as well, and I am not implying that uh, the company I work for are engaged in any of these risks. This is more of a generalized observation. First of all, there's profit motive, right? Profit motive. So a company could be motivated to elongate and expand the contract for profit. Why would they, how could they do this? Well, it wouldn't be hard. Um, if you're in a very complex environment, as Ambassador Blaney just outlined, and you have an overburdened embassy, and I don't know how many people in the embassy, was it like 13 or something? I don't know. It was like small. Not many. Yeah, very, very, a lot to do. Yeah, still bitter <laughs> over here. And, uh, <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, if, if you have an overworked 
uh, foreign service officer who's in charge of, of managing your 400 person multi-million dollar program, who doesn't have the expertise to know technically about SSR or DDR, well, who are they going to go to to ask for critical information? They're going to go to the contractor. So the contractor may have a conflict of interest about providing information that skews the contract in different ways to elongate the profit motive, to up profit. Um, and there's other, and they, they exploit asymmetries in information, principal uh, agent issues, et cetera. And lastly, when it comes to privatizing these functions, we have to really step back and ask ourselves at the policy level, do we really want to create a market for building armies in foreign countries? Right? Because that's sort of what we're doing. And we've seen that in the last 10 years with private security companies and so forth, where we've created a, a market for force. And the question is, what happens when we lose control of that market? What happens when, when Afghan companies start to model that, you know, warlords now are Warlords Inc. And they, they use, uh, you know, we have Colombians now in, in you know, we have, I mean, we have these no other companies that are, in, that are indigenous. Uh, these private security companies are indigenous. Um, I haven't seen this in Liberia yet, but we see this elsewhere, especially in the Gulf states right now. So what could, you know, lastly, so what could go wrong? <clears throat> There's too many things to name, so I think the first lesson that we've all experienced this room is humility. Um, there's two things I want to hit. <clears throat> One is, is that all institutions must rise together. We had a problem in Liberia where we, we had this amazing, well, I thought I was involved in the creation of it, an amazing program. Uh, and we produced, uh, after the first basic training class ended, um, we couldn't pay them. And the last thing you want in, in a conflict effect, the state are unpaid soldiers, right? Um, and the reason we couldn't pay them because the Ministry of Finance was not ready, had to, it had no capacity. And the reason they didn't is because of our own interagency problems. Um, our, our sort of DOD and uh, we, our defense sector reform was at a much stronger pace than our sort of finance sector reform. Um, and so making all institutions rise together is very difficult, very difficult. And the second is that, you know, one doesn't want to become a paradigm prisoner. Um, there, we all believe strongly that security and justice must be linked, and they should be linked but they can't always be linked. For example, what if the only way you can get ex-combatants to come in to de demobilize is by promising them amnesty? That gives you more security, but less justice, perhaps. Or what happens when we, in, in Liberia, we, the vetting team for the new basic recruits had the best records in the company, uh, in the country, on you know, who did what before the war and during the war, like war atrocities. But though those, that evidence was given to the team on conditions of anonymity. And if the Truth and Reconciliation Commission comes over and says, hand it all over to us now, do you say no, which would be bad for justice, or do you say, you know, you know, or security. So do you say yes? So there's a lot of uh, dilemmas uh, on the ground that don't, that brief well in, in DC and New York and Geneva, but on the ground are much more difficult. So in conclusion, as we come, you know, 10 years of, of many of these same questions have been asked, answered, and asked again. Um, I think what, would, what really would help at this point is a systemic analysis of why we fail to learn. There's a lot of theories out there, from bureaucracy to incentive structures in organizations, but uh, an, overall, or an overall comprehensive approach, looking at these different theories, applying it uh, to different case studies, and trying to figure out how do institutions learn, how do they go forward, how do we uh, capture lessons, we don't, we don't just learn lessons, but we capture them. Thank you. I think you achieved your goal, Sean, of waking people up, uh, <laughs> even though it's the morning session. And I'd like to come back to some of the things you uh, brought up, because I think they're absolutely crucial to the question of the topic of this panel, the US support to transitions in these two countries. And I think it's extremely good timing that we have Franklin Moore, who is at USAID and has seen the course of these uh, efforts, in, particularly in the Africa region, move forward. Because perhaps you can also inform us about where you see this trajectory where it's been and where it's going. So thank you, Franklin. 
Thank you, Joanna. Um, and let me thank the organizers for inviting me. It's been a wonderful chance for me to see a number of people who I haven't seen in quite some time since I've been away for a couple of years, and I've only been back for six months. Um, let me say a couple of general things before I dive into Liberia specifically. Um, my first one would be on the discussion of development and its relationship to humanitarian assistance and stabilization and reconstruction. We have a little course at AID, it's called AID 101, and it is for those who are going to interact with the agency, like new congressional staff or new staff at other agencies. And I do a little piece at the beginning on the history of AID. Um, my view, and this will tell you some of my thinking of the relationship between these, is that one of the first engagements with stabilization and reconstruction as an army was leaving that the United States engaged in was the Marshall Plan. And in fact, if you look at the Marshall Plan, one of the unique and wonderful things about it that makes it so American is that much of the Marshall Plan followed some examples that were laid out for the government by the Cooperative for American Relief in Europe, i.e. CARE. And it was an institution that was in existence and took on Europe as the United States was figuring out how it would take on Europe. And I think that if you look at those things, you realize that often for us, civil society and the government march in the same direction, influencing each other greatly in how one moves but there is a sequencing and layering of humanitarian assistance, stabilization, and development that is critically important. So I do not look at it as you have this period of stabilization and reconstruction, and that lasts for some period of time on a calendar, and then suddenly you have development. In fact, you see that those three things interact with each other and with humanitarian assistance all along the way. Second, as we look at um, stabilization and reconstruction and look at the activities, two critical questions to answer. One, what was it that caused the destabilization in the first place? Now, in the case of Liberia, ultimately a war, but there were things that caused the war, and it's the things that caused the war that caused the destabilization not necessarily the war. So to repair some of that, one has to get back before the war and look at some of the conditions on the ground that led to the war, because that's what led to the destabilization. And the second question, I think, is even more critical than the first. And that is, if you're engaged in stabilization and reconstruction, is a return to what existed before actually stable? And in most cases, the answer to that is no, which is why there's such a link between the stabilization and the development that needs to take place. So generally, as one engages in stabilization and reconstruction, what one is seeking is something that is greater, better than what had, it ex had existed at the point of destabilization and it's looking for how one layers and sequences a variety of activities that are development activities to those humanitarian and those reconstruction and stabilization activities. Now, the two speakers have concentrated on two of the biggest things that took place in Liberia. One, the demobilization and movement of troops, we can call them troops, from three warring factions. Um, and the importance of that, um, we've heard a discussion of co-opting competing movements, the importance of that in co-opting competing movements. So we, we've heard something about that. We've also heard something about the consolidation of a new democracy and the ability in a stabilization period to look more to the long term and to look at how we get to a legitimate government in Liberia. 
Some of the other things that came online um, that were also critically important, and this statement of everything should move together, I'm not sure it needs to move together, but you certainly need to have some idea of how you're moving those pieces, because if you move one of them too far ahead of the others, your structure's gonna crumble. So there were some other things that were taking place that were critically important, and let me highlight a couple of them. One of them was, what does one do with internally displaced people? And how does one move internally displaced people probably back to the area that they fled and back into a set of activities that allow them to stabilize, be productive, and move forward in something that one actually can say is development and change. So that was a significant activity, which was one of the early activities. Another was the learning agenda. Now, of course, we're talking about a society that's been at war for 14 years. And I can tell you there wasn't much schooling going on during that period of time. So suddenly you have a society with a backlog in things as simple as literacy and, and numeracy. And the need to take several generations and move them forward in literacy and numeracy became a critical piece. So one of the things that took place was a huge training of trainers for people who would go in to educate populations. A couple of other things. Um, yes, it is true that in general, external funds should be giving way to internal funds. That means there has to be a marshalling of internal funds. So another of the important things was working on financial management systems to increase the capacity of a legitimate government to actually raise revenue so that the nation state could begin to move on its own legs. Last thing I'll talk about, other than general economic and social reintegration, was some things that actually brought normalcy to various parts of Liberian society. So there was a strong push early to re-engage the electricity service in the capital, and importantly as a symbol, to get the streetlights back on in the capital because that allowed a large portion, very decisive portion of the population to begin to think that life is returning to normal and there are other things we can look to that are gonna lead us on this pathway that returns us to where we need to be. Now, have we finished with stabilization and reconstruction, much less development in Liberia? No. It is very much a work in progress. There is much progress taking place. And I'll close with a little story that is interesting. Last year, I spent time in Liberia three times. And I happened to always go to Liberia with people who had not spent time there. So the last time I was in Liberia, I was there. I was gone for four months. I was back. I was gone for five months. And I came back the third time. And I had taken a, a number of diplomats from Rome, from Food and Agriculture Organization and World Food Program to Liberia. So we land at the airport, and where if you've been to Monrovia, you know Roberts Field is some distance outside of Monrovia. So we're driving from Roberts Field into Monrovia, and we're passing the landscape. And Myself and one of my guests are both looking out the car window and going, wow, wow, wow. We get two blocks from Monrovia, and she turns to me and she goes, wow, I can't believe how many burned out buildings there are. And I jerk back in my seat and I turn to her and I say, that was not why I was going wow. I was going wow because in nine months, 
I can't believe how many burned out buildings have been replaced with something that is operating and functional. So it just lets you know that when you come into an area subjected to reconstruction, stabilization, and again to a path of development, it's very interesting what you recognize and you don't recognize as change and what is important and not important for change. I'll stop there. So Franklin, the lesson is reconstruction is in the eye of the beholder. Yes. And I think um, we have heard this from different speakers in different contexts. But I'd like to pose some questions to our Liberia part of the panel uh, before we go to a broader conversation with the audience. And I'd like to start, um, Ambassador Blaney, uh, you talked about the lessons you learned working with the United Nations, getting the right resolution and making sure things would happen. But um, if you contrast that, I mean, getting the UN involved was probably an easier lift for Liberia, whereas in Colombia you could have never had a UN resolution because of basically US interests in the region. And I think that's an important political or geopolitical discussion, especially as we look forward to transitions which we face in the Middle East and the challenges of working with the United Nations because of the different conflicts among the P5. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about how that enabled the, the, the fact that Liberia was not in the, the strategic lens of the United States, but was an important partner historically because of its origins that made a UN uh, operation consistent with US interests possible. And maybe you want to challenge me on that question, but I, I think there is a, an interesting contrast. Um, one thing that you might all recall is that this, the crisis of Liberia and, and, and trying to end the war and, and, uh, and, and, and the exit of Charles Taylor from Liberia all took place during the Iraq uh, situation. And um, there was not, one of the things Washington has trouble doing is, is having binocular vision sometimes. <laughs> Or uh, there was not at all times, uh, you know, a, a central focus on Liberia, and there was division in Washington about what to do about Liberia. Um, and I credit the then Secretary Colin Powell uh, as having my back mm -hmm. uh, here in Washington and being a strong voice for uh, helping me uh, to put together an overall. Uh, approach toward Liberia that included uh, a UN peacekeeping mission. But I, I, the reason I say this is that I, I don't think you can assume that it was anything like an automatic step that the United States uh, took at all. Um, and in fact, um, the steps we took thereafter were, were very much uh, uh, debated. So um, I'm not in a position to say, you know, weigh the relative interests between Liberia and Colombia. Certainly there is, a, there is a deep historical relationship with Liberia. But I think that um, getting together a, a, an approach that included the peacekeepers and, as I said before, even before they were there, the African peacekeepers, who were really the vanguard in this situation, was a complex... Uh, highly political uh, 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 maneuver that that uh, that took a lot of effort, and so there was nothing automatic about it. Thank you, um, Sean. You mentioned something at the very end of your talk as to why we fail to learn lessons, and I think that's a you know you said it casually, but I think there's a much deeper answer to that, and. Um, if you were to identify what those lessons are, if you could, what are the ones you think we failed to learn uh, in situations such as Liberia, where we have heavy contractor involvement and they are doing important work because of the limitations of U.S. resources in a country where you need additional personnel? But perhaps you could identify those because it was provocative enough, I think, to to think this through a little bit more. Thank you, Joanna. This is where we. Pay for the sense of being provocative. We get the answer. <laughs> um, I think there are, there are many lessons learned. And I, looking at this room, there's a lot of familiar faces. And for 10 years, we've been going to lessons learned uh, meetings, right? I, uh, so um, 
What uh, two two things? What well, one is that uh, I, I can speak to my small patch, if you will, which is sort of the contract element. I think, you know, a, a contracting is is not a necessarily evil thing. It's not, it shouldn't be categorically banned. I think it's, but I think the lessons learned is, is the United States didn't take the time. It had a. It didn't take the time to sort of set up the market in a, in a, in a, in a way that that promotes the benefits and mitigates the risk. And now uh, I think the market now has expanded beyond. Uh, U.S. control, and uh, we, we're starting to see these companies appear all over the world. Uh, and so I think there was a missed opportunity, and things sort of unfolded in an ad hocracy. Um, but ri a larger question is, is why do we fail to learn? And that's beyond the scope of my, my limited time here. But I think that would be a, a good project, for example, for a CSIS or another organization to take on, uh, like what are the theories of, of institutional learning and how does it apply to the last 10 years and what can we learn, sorry, going forward about how to, uh, how to do this? Well, I think that uh, you, you suggest a good project and uh, I think when we get to the audience's time, they may have some observations on this as well. But uh, I also wanted to get back to some of the things you said, Franklin, in the comparison that you have seen over time in Liberia, because I think there is a s success story in many cases there. I mean, transitions are transitions. They're dynamic. And your experience with your other donor colleagues when you went back you know, implies the eye of the beholder. But there's something more, I think, in the trajectory of assistance that uh, we, we miss, and that is patience and humility, uh, that these are not going to happen overnight. But maybe you'd like to comment, since you've had a great experience at aid also in the environment issue and climate areas which are impact on the vulnerability of states. Well, I, I think that, that patience is critically important. Um, you've talked about looking at the environment, climate change, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for some of that, for me, it, it gets at the two questions I asked. One is, um, can you only return to where you were? And the fact is, no, you have to go much further than that. And do you have to consider those things that may have had a very destabilizing element? And you have to do something about those. And certainly, if you look at the case of Liberia, interestingly enough, while you had three warring factions, you had a lot of the finance of those three warring factions, illegal logging in the forest. And that, you know, Liberia has one of the primary trop remaining tropical forested pieces of West Africa, of what used to be a much larger contiguous forest. Um, it highlighted that there had always been problems with forest land tenure. Um, and it allowed that to be one of the things that a Liberian government could begin to look at, the whole concept of how communities related to their forest in tenure, because it was going to have an effect on their environment, on their biodiversity, on climate change, as well as, importantly, on income. And it became one of the things that if you look at a Liberia now, it has gone much further than it was before there was conflict. So it's one of the things that, because it got caught up in financing the conflict, it sort of highlighted it as a problem that people needed to move beyond, and they've successfully moved beyond that, and that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, I think that's all true. I just want to make it clear, though, that the, the highly patrimonial system that, and, and extremely venal system that was in Liberia in the post-Taylor period was not handled uh, by the, the, the indigenous people there in the first case. Uh, what happened was that the international donor community, uh, at times led by us, created a system uh, uh, an external auditing system. Uh, we actually put people in the finance ministry, in the central bank, so that it's called GMAP, the, I've got the title here, which is the, uh, 
Well, you guys figure it out. <laughs> well, I talk. Uh, but but the, the, the go Governance Economic Management Assistance Program or something like that. That's it. Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and what we did was, was uh, to help them detox this system. And in fact, when Ellen Johnson Sirley took over years later, um, I was expecting the GMAP system to be abandoned. Uh, but she kept it because she knew, I think she knew, that uh, that the people of Liberia, many of them during uh, the previous administrations, had been trained to be uh, venal. That's how they made their living. I once went into the Department of, of Commerce, the Ministry of Commerce in Liberia during the early years, and I asked an official, uh, when's the last time you got paid? And he told me, two years ago. Um, and I said, why are you here? And he just gave me a smile. It was a systematic patrimonial venal system that we had to break down. On logging, it didn't start with, with the Liberian government that was elected. It started with another international commission uh, that canceled all the logging concessions, tabla rasa. Uh, so, you know, we need to set the record straight here a little bit. And um, by the way, and as long as we're doing that, nobody got amnesty in Liberia. All right, uh, that I would never do that. And, um, uh, uh, and, and quite rightly, uh, the education thing, as Franklin pointed out, um, was, was very important. And that was the number one when, when people would come in, combatants, usually quite young, to surrender their, their literally surrender their AK 47s and take them. The number one thing we would ask them is, what do you want to do now that the war is over? And they would say to me or other people, I want to go to school. That was the number one answer. Well, I think that that is, you know, a universal cry. And I will add one lesson learned, Sean, to your issue about pain, the former soldiers. Uh, and I think we learned this even bef uh, perhaps before Liberia. In Haiti, I was responsible for getting the payout to the former BOD, the former military. And the first day we were going to pay these former soldiers in the different venues, uh, we got an emergency call. I remember I was sitting in the OTI office that one of our employees, a young Spaniard, had his arm broken before the pay had even gotten there. And another young guy had been beat silly and had been had to be hospitalized. And that was when we began to learn the lesson that when you were going to pay soldiers, first you had to pay them. Uh, and do it in a timely fashion because otherwise they would know where the guns were and how to get back to them. But more important, that it had a very symbolic value in living up to commitments and creating legitimacy for both the transition and the uh, new governments. And I think that is a lesson uh, that has been positively learned by the United States and other governments in terms of making a transition work. You cannot neglect the people who once were f fighters. Um, I think uh, you have all been a wonderful audience, and there's so much expertise that I see out here, and I'm sure many questions, that we want to turn this part of the program over to you. I know there are people with microphones that are walking around. If you'll identify yourselves, I will start on this side of the room, and I will work my way across. There's a person, a young man in the back, yes, uh, right, right next to you. And would you please identify yourself by name and organization, if you wish? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm Leon Weintraub, University of Wisconsin, um, formerly of State Department. I have a, a question for Mr. McFate. You, you mentioned as uh, one of the uh, advantages, <coughs> excuse me, of being a contractor is more innovation and less type of uh, bureaucracy. <coughs> you, you gave the example of uh, human rights vetting of people to be in a reformed security force or police force uh, in the absence of any records. I'm wondering, uh, this is something I had to work with frequently, I'm wondering what, what do you do, if you could expand on that a little bit. I think I'm going to take two more questions and then uh, let's go to the middle of the room. There are two people right here and then we'll go over to the other side. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
My name is Max Kelly. I'm with Booz Allen Hamilton. Uh, two questions. The first, um, great discussion, and this is both of these questions have been touched on during the discussion. The first is that often in these situations you have, uh, even if you have top level um, investment or, or uh, by a, a host nation government trying to emerge from conflict, these governments aren't monolithic. They often have competing interests within them, and those interests are often tied to the previous patterns of economic marginalization or corruption, et cetera. Again, all of this has been alluded to. My question is, how do we do a better job of engaging with those governments and strengthening those who are re genuine partners um, and not allowing them to either be uh, marginalized or, or overthrown by uh, the more venal parts of the government, or delegitimized by the very support we're giving them. And then the other question um, is building off of something that Mr. Moore said, talking about the electricity in Monrovia. Again, another challenge that we have is we tend to take very technical approaches to needs assessments. Uh, and we end up with very long lists of what these countries need and have a hard time prioritizing along those. And, and because we're trying to achieve political effects, symbol, symbolism matters. Uh, you alluded to the importance of, of the symbolism of turning the electricity on and the, se the message that that sent. And I'd be interested to hear more from other panelists about uh, how you go about identifying the particular areas that have symbolic importance in these conflicts uh, to signal a return to stability. Thank you. And there's one more question. I think Assistant Secretary Scheer had his hand up. But you can get a microphone over to him. Thank you very much, uh, Jim Shear, formerly DOD. Uh, and uh, thanks to all the panelists for a very enlightening discussion. A question for both sides of the panel. Uh, how do we, in terms of developing this uh, web of peace, as one of you mentioned, how do we work with diasporas in a way that helps? I'm thinking. In Colombia, you walk down the halls of the bureaucracy, you see a lot of Colombians who are educated overseas, they're back, younger generation, trying to be change agents. Uh, notwithstanding that, you fly to La Macarena, you can do it in one hour, but it takes 15 days to drive by truck going back. So maybe physical infrastructure is an issue too. But, um, in, and in Liberia, uh, Johnson Sirleaf. Um, uh, diasporas can be part of the solution, or as we've seen in Iraq and in parts of the Balkans, part of the problem. So I'd be interested to hear your, your perspectives on that. Thank you. Okay, uh, we've got uh, three hot questions, and then I'll come back to people who have their hands up and take another round. But uh, who would like to start? You want to do the sure. I'll start with that, but invite others to chime in. Um, Yes, the diaspora was very important in the Liberia situation. Uh, as a matter of fact, it, part of the diaspora helped fund the rebel movement in Liberia, the LURD and, and others. Uh, so it's very important. My answer is that um, there needs to be efforts made as part of the workout of building national identity. and. Um, there needs to be uh, uh, there needs to be efforts to reduce tribalism conferences to try to reduce that and and ask the question of who is a librarian you know am I a librarian and, and what, over being a member of such and such a tribe now earlier there were so many problems involved just stopping the war, keeping it stopped, which is, with, uh, and, and doing the rest of the economic, the political, the everything work out. But if I had to point to one area today, and by the way, I think that what, compared to when I was in Liberia and where it is today, it's a miracle. Uh, 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 nothing, I, I agree with you, Franklin, that it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, but um, there's still work to do important work and and undone work and part of that is right in the area that you ask about which is getting the diaspora and the people to achieve a kind of a national identity which supersedes that which divides them whether it's their their tribe their ethnic group their religion and so conferences 
uh, it, it, what uh, Nelson Mandela used to call indabas in South Africa need to be held. I think uh, President John Sirleaf has this in mind already, but it comes none too early. I mean, I think it should come soon so that we don't have something like that undercut what has been a success story. There was, a, Franklin, go ahead. I, I would just add one piece to that. Uh, I think that the diaspora is a potentially very good thing um, because it brings back experience, innovation, and often a lot of cash to a uh, country. Uh, I do think that you have to be careful that the diaspora you bring back are tied to the new vision of the country, not the old vision of the country they left. And I think that that's critically important. Um, Many times you can have diaspora come back who are sometimes not valued by other citizens in the country who didn't leave and who sometimes left because there were some things they believed about the country that have changed and they would like to change them back. So um, I, while I think by and large they are a huge potential, um, every now and then there can be some problems created by diaspora. I think in the case of Columbia, I'm not uh, up to date as to today, but uh, we probably didn't use the, the Colombian diaspora uh, enough. But um, that said, I think what, what, what we did do is capitalize on the private sector, uh, and we've not talked about public-private partnerships. Um, as a way of consolidating and uh, providing some sustainability to some of the efforts. In the case of, of Colombia, that has worked, and um, uh, there are some that are more mature than others, and uh, there you can bring in and pull in the diaspora as well, so with, with a connection with the private sector. So. Um. I don't have anything to say on the diaspora, so I'll speak about the government question that you, and of course I was in government, so um, it's, a, it's a, a special perspective. Um, you always have these stereotypes of government officials, um, and I've always found out that you'd be surprised on the talent that you find in local governments way in the, at the municipality level especially. And even in some ministries, um, there's always very, very good people, or maybe we're just lucky in Colombia, but, um, and if you can't find them, you're not looking hard enough. Hard enough. Um, it's just that, that you should expect from them the same thing that you would expect them to expect of you. Um, people don't necessarily behave the way that you are expecting. And chances are that you will find a lot of people that are very good. They are committed. They came back. Um, they wanted to work for their country. Um, and they just need motivation and need to be pushed and recognized for their job. Let's go. Um, and if you have no more comments, there are some hands up. There was a woman here in the front. If we could get a microphone up front, then we'll go over to the side. And uh, I see Doug waving his hand back there, so let's take those three, and we'll go to you two. Let's. Hi. Uh, Julie Werbel from USAID. Thank you very much for your uh, comments today. Um, you've done an, an a really excellent job describing the complexities of the, op of the operating environments that, that we face. The challenge is that the resources that we have to engage are significantly constrained. To give you an example, I was asked to design a DDR program in a country emerging from transition and given $150,000 to do it. So um, my question to you is, how do we um, take some of these lessons learned and apply them in a strategic way to be catalytic? Well, we really can't be comprehensive, but perhaps we can take some of these, this innovation um, and, um, and be the source of that, of that innovation. Uh David Throop. Um, Johns Hopkins Sites and CSIS, and formerly of the British Foreign Office. Um, 
I was deeply involved in Sierra Leone, so not very different from Liberia. And uh, it struck me that there is um, a complex contradiction, really, in the short attention span of the international community to long-term engagements in places like Liberia and Sierra Leone, the need to stick the state back together as quickly as possible, and Franklin Moore's observation that it is a serious error to rush in and try to reconstruct the state as it was before it collapsed, because there was something fundamentally rotten with state institutions uh, and their relationship with society. So um, my view in Sierra Leone is probably the Brits rushed in far too quickly to stick back together what had been there before. And it does seem to me virtually everywhere that that is a fundamental tendency of the international community when it has to deal with the devastation of places like Liberia or Afghanistan. That there are existing patronage networks, which we heard in the first session, in a sense have to be co-opted, and yet are also fundamentally rotten to the core and a problem of state cohesion. So how do we square that? And my second question is DDR. It struck me that DDR is very rapidly captured by those patronage networks. So in southern province uh, of Sierra Leone, 25,000 went through the rehabilitation and job training program. But I would say 24,950 of those were government guys, either from the militia or from the army. And probably the Revolutionary United Front guys got 50 of the 25,000 training programs. So that is a problem. And then you have the problem of the fundamental distortion of the local economy could by the international presence. Uh, could you ask your question? Well, the we question is, how do, how do you resolve the problem of the international community's distorting effects on the economy? You've got all these UN guys, all this international aid pouring in, which in the short term transforms local job opportunities, but is not sustainable. And secondly, you have the problem of the patronage networks determining who actually gains the benefits of DDR, which is also fundamentally distorting. Can I take one, parts yeah. one and four? Yeah, <laughs> well, and, and I do want to, because we're running short of time, and I know Ambassador Alialde has another commitment okay, at state. Uh, let me uh, get Doug Brooks uh, the microphone, and then we'll take these very provocative questions and let you all have a chance uh, to respond. Doug Brooks, I'm a consultant formerly with the International Stability Operations Association. I'll, I'll start with part 16 of my question first. Uh, no, my question is on the security issue. I think one of the unifying factors of both these success stories uh, is that there was a certain amount of security that allowed the NGOs and the contractors to actually function in a, in a successful way. And I just wonder, were there specific signs uh, that you can cite that were, were signs that the security had reached a point where these NGOs or where the contractors were, you guys were essentially able to do what you wanted to do or needed to do? Let me take parts of these questions. Um, first of all, I think that um, the resource question that was asked is very important. And um, I don't think that given the budgetary situation that the United States and other countries are under, that we can expect, expect much improvement on, on that uh, for countries that tend to, as was made in another question, fall out of mind a little bit once the immediate crisis is clear. By the way, on that falling out of, out of uh, consciousness, that's a real problem, and that's one of the reasons you need that that web of peace and allies and as many people as you can because it helps keep the domestic <coughs> consciousness 
in, in, in of the parliaments and of the the Congress and others higher than it would be. Does it so, so solve the problem? No. But if you have a lot of people involved in it, it helps you keep the level of consciousness and the and, and the appropriations up. So that's my contribution to that. But I'd say that on on getting more money, one thing that as you move forward on the economic advancement, uh, you can look at uh, uh, partnerships with the private sector, um, other ways to draw in private capital. Um, when I was out there, I was just trying to get the private sector not to leave completely and abandon Liberia. But now it's to the point where I think it's the second or third highest drawing uh, pri uh, direct investment uh, target in Africa. So there's lots of ways to maybe creatively combine those tough objectives with, with, with broader programs and, and, and real capital uh, for, uh, for partnerships with the private sectors and others, uh, I think, that are worth looking into to try to multiply what you, what you do have, because I don't think you're going to get more. <laughs> If, if I can add to the resource question, um, because I, I know where you're sitting and I was in a similar situation in Paraguay uh, as ambassador and we had a growing uh, insurgency group in the north and there were, there were no resources. And, and so what I found myself doing is really using the interagency much more strategically. So let's say the Department of Defense had their humanitarian program. I would say, okay, let's go. Let's all go to the north. Let's all go to the north. And trying to be very strategic also about trying to get the private sector to open their eyes and look at that region. It takes more time. Um, it takes uh, more of trying to hone in on what you can leverage. And eventually, we had a program um, that maybe wasn't robust, but as U.S. government, we were able to contribute with with uh, with uh, the uh, Paraguayans to try to address it better. So, the interagency is is I think using that a bit more strategic. Franklin, just quickly, um, uh, this morning when Robert talked, he talked about a body of data and the assimilation of data and the use of data. I actually think that as one looks at, at everyone who has the ability to marshal some resources on countries, that as the data flows better and as the data gets better, one finds that there is greater interest in participation. I believe that that's true domestically in terms of the interagency and that it is data that has brought other, other institutions of the U.S. government to the table. But I also think that's very true um, internationally, and that increasingly one begins, if you go from a Sierra Leone and a Liberia, and you compare that to a Niger and a Mali, you see that, that donors already now sit down to share data on a Niger and a Mali, and it has, in fact, attracted other donors, it has attracted some private sector, and it has attracted some civil service organizations. And that is because there is a greater understanding of some of the relationships because of the data that's being amassed. So, um, quickly, to, to talk quickly about DDR of Julie and David's question. Um, my concern about a catalytic, I think it's a great idea to have a, a comprehensive version. One of the problems, though, is I wonder if it's better to have no, did, no DDR program than a halfway done one, if that's grammatically even correct. Um, because you don't want some groups to be armed and uh, other groups to be unarmed, and they become a predator and prey. Uh, and it's a new dynamic to the conflict. Um, Regarding uh, capture of DDR, one, th th that's a very difficult question. Capture is always an issue, uh, as Dr. Thrupp, as you know, uh, for anything, particularly with DDR. Um, one of the things that we tried to do in Liberia is we use cell phone technology to uh, load people's up with, with money rather than giving it to, to people, and then it sort of get, they get shut down for the money after they get it through the DDR process. Um, so maybe there's a, a technological uh, options that we can look into as well. And uh, regarding Doug's question about security, one of the advantages that we had in Liberia versus, say, Iraq or Afghanistan is that there was security provided by UNMIL. 
Uh, the other, in my opinion, another uh, factor is that I think there's genuine war fatigue in Liberia after 14 years of war. There's always spoilers and managing spoilers, and Ambassador Blaney can address that far better than I. Uh, and lastly, there's a question from the first round of questions about human rights vetting and how we did it without public records. Um, I can talk to you afterward, but basically I wrote an article for Military Review in 2007 that sort of lays it out. One of the things that we did that was very successful is something called public vetting. So you take people's, the candidates agree to this, uh, it, 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 they, uh, you take pictures of them, you make Facebooks, and you have the noms de guerre or their names, and you put them in IDP camps and cities, and you say, if there's any reason any of these people should not represent you in the future military of Liberia, please contact this number, this email, this, you know, this, this office. You could do it anonymously. And we, of course, we got a lot of false positives, but the, we also got a lot of uh, good information as well. Thank you. Uh, la lastly, on the UN effects question, um, yes, it was a huge positive effect in initially, and it still is very important, and it is distorting. But um, now the Liberian economy is much stronger and the UN force is withdrawing gradually. So yes, it's distorting the economy, but that distortion factor is, is, is reducing and the, and the broader economy, as the broader Liberian economy expands. Let's take, there were a couple of more hands that I'd like to take. Uh, please, a microphone on the right side. And I saw a gentleman on the other side, there in the two. Pat, and I see Pat Fagan, so let's get those three questions on the floor. And anybody else who has a question, if you can make it quick, uh, please, let's, let's take them all and let the panel have their course, because we have to stop on time to keep up with the schedule. So please. Juliana Pilar, and I teach uh, democratization, civilization, and reconstruction at the Institute of World Politics. And Ten years ago, Please put I, your microphone. I was um, vice president of uh, programs at IFAS. Um, listening to all these panels, one gets a sense that what is being reconstructed and stabilized are, uh, is stuff. But they're human beings involved as well. And one of the problems in all of these uh, traumatized areas is that the population needs to get up and go. In Sierra Leone is a very good example, actually, of where the population has, appears not to be quite able to get up and go. So the simple, qu the narrow question is, what would you say the United States and generally the international community has been able to do to change to re not only reconstruct the infrastructure, but the human fiber. Uh, next question. Um, okay, Bob, I think. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, are there opportunities to use the internet and cell phones to get people together and get funding for projects and get transparency. Thank you. Um, and if we'll go to the left side of the room, there are two or three more people Qu quickly. David Sedney, I was up until about a month ago, I was a colleague of uh, <coughs> Jim's at DOD. We, we were both deputy assistant secretaries. I did Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, as I listened to the panel and going back to your original uh, question about lessons learned, uh, I have to say frankly, what I hear are lessons learned about Colombia and lessons learned about Liberia rather than generalized <coughs> uh, lessons for dealing with transitions. And in fact, I'm almost worried that a search for those generalized lessons might be a dangerous search given the particularities. Um, so my question for the panel is, do you think your experience is generalizable or is it really just particular to the countries involved? Patricia Fagan, Georgetown University. Um, I, uh, my question is based on my own comparative research on integration of post-conflict populations in Colombia and Liberia. The Macarena Initiative was po is positive to my mind, largely on, well, one of the reasons it's positive is because it was regional in scope and included both urban and rural areas. Now, the gist of my question, which applies to both Liberia and Colombia, is on that theme. 
would you, would the panelists distinguish between stabilization initiatives in rural areas and urban areas? I think there is a distinction to be made. And I'd point out on, on Franklin Moore's comment about the IDPs. The IDPs began as a rural population. They, many of the, they are now largely an urban population and therefore stabilization of the IDPs has become an urban problem. I think that's emblematic not only in Liberia but in other countries as well. And I'd appreciate your observations. Thank you. And I think there's a gentleman in the back who had his hand up, and then I think we will turn this over to the panelists to both respond to these excellent questions and to any other wrap-up remarks that they have so we can finish on time. And all of you who have been patient can go and have a uh, nice lunch and prepare for the next session. So um, next question, sir. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Joe Foley. I'm with the National Federation of Croatian Americans. And I've got another region-based uh, question for the panel. Um, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, the current and future fate of uh, the Croatian Bosnians, we believe, um, is possibly the glue that might keep Bosnia together. Uh, the Croatian Bosnians continue to be discriminated against in a political and economic manner. And uh, the Dayton Peace Accords has established them as the smallest constituent peoples there. And um, it may be the glue that keeps the country together as separatist uh, tendencies continue to go forward since uh, the Dayton Peace Accords has been signed. Uh, this is a Latin American Liberian legacy panel, but what, um, other than continuing to push Bosnia toward multilateral Western organizations, uh, uh, which they've achieved very little success to date, uh, what uh, role can the international development community play as uh, these post-conflict arenas such as Bosnia and uh, the later, uh, the larger extent, the Balkans, what do you have to contribute to possible help there in the Balkans as it's continued to be needed? Okay. Uh, since we, you know, why don't we go down the line, I think, and maybe you can respond to these questions. Frank, let's start with you, Franklin, and then go to Sean and uh, Ambassador Blaney, and then uh, Juan Pablo, you'll have the last word. Um, a couple of quick things. I, I think that there are elements of what we talked about that are generalizable. Um, and I think there are lessons that one learns that are general lessons similar to the, to the 10 steps. Now, obviously, they need to, once you get to a particular country in a particular circumstance, um, move them around so that they relate to that circumstance. But I think there are some things that are generalizable. Um, let me say what I know about IDPs in Liberia. Um, I think that it is true that there are a fair number of IDPs that have gone to urban areas. I'm not sure that it's a higher number than the general migration of the population to urban areas. So I'm not sure that I think that IDPs have diverted to urban areas at a time when the general rural population was very happy being the rural population. And I think that there are many cases of IDPs in Liberia that actually left where they lived and went to live with other people of their same ethnic group as extended family, both in Liberia and some of them actually were refugees in Ivory Coast and lived with what are recognizably members of their ethnic group. Some of those have returned to their original areas. Some of them have not. But I don't think that it's wholesale a IDP issue that went from rural to urban. Um, and my last comment on um, Sierra Leone and up and running, I think that, that from a human point of view, there have been some just amazing things that have taken place in Sierra Leone. And I would highlight there is a group of women who spent time in India being trained on solar technology. And they have a name, I'm trying to remember what, what the name of them is now that they're back in Sierra Leone. They've been very successful at installing solar technology around the country. And in fact, Mono River Union is making use of them to help train women in the other states of Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea, and Liberia um, because it is such a successful transformation. So I think that there are some cases that are very human that have looked at pockets of the population in Sierra Leone and said, 
here's a group that we think we can make some progress with. They've been very successful and many of them have either been trained in country or come back to the country and have lives that are quite different than the lives they had before. That's it for me. Just very briefly, to the question of human fiber, one of the things that we did in Liberia as an example of this is that the first basic training modules that we went through, we spent more time on uh, teaching civics than being on the rifle range. Because everybody agreed at the time that librarians knew how to fire a rifle, but <laughs> at what is a question, right? So um, we spent a lot of time, we work with the ICRC, and the, the curriculum was developed by librarians, not by the company. Um, and uh, later on, uh, tragically, that was taken from the basic uh, training, well, curriculum's a strong word, but you know what I'm saying, uh, because of, of budget issues. Um, and that was the way we tried to, 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 to so I guess, humanize uh, that part of the training. Uh, regarding uh, generalizable, that's a, that's a good observation. I, I would say that there are, for example, the, the size of the military of Liberia was determined not by the, the number of troops it would take to defend the territorial boundaries and borders of the state, but how, what's the capacity of the government to pay them on time? You know, we find that, that uh, places, and that's not just Liberia, a lot of uh, un unstable countries, there's a bigger threat of instability from unpaid soldiers um, than there are from an invading nation state. Uh, so that's an example. Thanks. Okay, so we did recap human fiber, right? <laughs> Okay, let me talk about some of the others that weren't touched upon uh, a little bit. Uh, on generalizable, I, I, hoped, I had hoped that some of my remarks on the nonlinear nature and uh, the following legitimacy on, on the importance of, f of having finance for your strategy, uh, tempo, and some of these other things, uh, I didn't mean those as li Liberius specific, but rather lessons that might be applied to and, and other things that I said to other situations. So I hope you got something there from that. Um, the internet cell phones, uh, I think that's, that's open for business. So that one, uh, I would say, is very important. Uh, you know, before even Liberia was up and running economically, these cell phones started, started appearing. And Today, more than ever, it's, it's not only an, an economic piece, but it's also a stability piece. I mean, from Brazil to Egypt, right? We're going through an era of hyper-connectivity so that the, uh, the failings of governments, the wrongdoings of governments are known now instantly and more broadly than ever. And so I think that, uh, that uh, you know, that that's an excellent reason why, for for instance, we have to concentrate on the rule of law and on transparency in government more than ever, for the sake of stability. Because now there's instant connectivity, and the population knows, and they don't want to be saddled with with uh, with predatory governments. Um, on the Bosnia, uh, first of all, I would say right up front, I'm not a Bosnia expert, but I would say that one of the things that has been done in, in, uh, in that area and, but needs to continue to be done is the same thing that I pointed to in Liberia at the very end, which is uh, a, the search for national identity. And that includes some sort of equal opportunity or more equal oppor economic opportunity than exists, um, which is usually a, a big part of the problem. Um, and my understanding of the situation is that you know you've got to reduce that that level of distrust of, of hatred in some cases. You've got to talk about it, and and you know uh, uh, Nelson Mandela's Ndaba uh, formula it's done, did wonderful things. Uh, talk about them, but also look at what the real situation is in terms of of forging that national identity and equalizing opportunity. And that might be something that actually is, is good for, to think about in a lot of places. Okay, I'll finish with, um, with the urban rural question and uh, some comments on the rehabilitation, the human fiber question. Um, 
I guess what, what we've learned or I've learned in Colombia is that uh, even though, of course, they are different, the rural and the urban settings, uh, people find common ground on the symbolic value of property. So if somebody goes to, to an urban area, they would seek to own their house. Um, they can't own the land. They don't have the same relationship. We have a word in Spanish that's arraigo. Um, it's like the sense of belonging to a plot of land. You don't have that in an urban area, but they would they look for it in a house. Um, and of course, massive housing projects are very hard to to finance and implement. So that's the biggest challenge, I would say, in the urban area. And in the rural area, it goes once again to the property and owning the, that piece of land or having possession over that piece of land. Um, but property is what can help, and the symbolic value of property can uh, restore the trust of communities. Um, if, if that is done in a way that you don't face their situation as a pathology, as, as if you were sick. Um, of course, there's people that have been uh, literally traumatized by war, and they need to be uh, intervened clinically. But that's, that's the minority. That's, I would say, I, I remember an IOM expert said, that's only 5% of people. Um, what people need to speak about is what they feel from, from after uh, violence. They need to go back to doing what they used to do before they were intimidated, killed, or subject to violence. They have to think about what they were thinking at the time that violence took place, the stereotypes and the prejudices that they had and in some way allowed for that violence to happen. And they have to remember what they, what happened, uh, but remember it in a way that they give new meaning to the things that they are living now. Um, this is being implemented in a small project in Colombia, but I, it's the biggest innovation that the government has in the last year. And for my, from my experience, if I had been able to do that in government, I would go massively with this, massively with this, because it's very, very efficient. Well, uh, we could go on for a long time, and there are so many more uh, good things that await us. Uh, but I'd like to ask you to give a round of applause to our excellent panel.